SpaceX's Starship is pushing the boundaries of spaceflight, but questions remain about its safest and most efficient landing method. While Mechazilla has shown promise, its long-term viability is uncertain, sparking discussions about alternative approaches, including sea-based landings. Speculation has surged with the sighting of the USS John F. Kennedy near Starbase. Could a similar massive platform be repurposed for Starship landings, launches, or transport? With SpaceX's history of innovation, anything is possible. Join us as we explore this exciting possibility. This is Alpha Tech. Let's dive in. As Starship's development progresses, discussions about the safest and most efficient landing methods remain a hot topic. While SpaceX has successfully caught Starship twice using Mechazilla, this method has yet to demonstrate the level of safety and reliability needed to maximize Starship's long-term operational potential. Several alternative approaches have been proposed, with many experts and enthusiasts arguing that a sea-based landing could be a viable and even advantageous option for SpaceX. Recently, speculation surrounding this idea has only intensified with the appearance of a massive warship near Starbase. That warship was none other than the USS JFK, a legendary aircraft carrier that once stood as a powerhouse of the US Navy. Earlier this month, it was spotted passing by SpaceX's facility on its way to the port of Brownsville for scrapping, marking the final chapter of its long and distinguished service. However, its brief presence near Starbase has sparked curiosity. Could SpaceX repurpose similar large-scale maritime platforms for Starship operations? Not just for landings, but also for launches and transportation? To explore that possibility, let's take a closer look at this legendary aircraft carrier. The USS John F. Kennedy was one of the last conventionally powered aircraft carriers built before the Navy transitioned to nuclear propulsion. Laid down in 1964 and launched in 1967, it served for nearly four decades before being decommissioned in 2007. At 321 meters or 1,052 feet in length and standing at 59 meters or 194 feet tall, the ship had a displacement ranging from 22,000 to 82,000 tons, depending on its loadout. Its four steam turbines generated immense power, propelling the massive vessel through the ocean with ease. With its size, durability, and heavy load capacity, it's easy to see why many believe a carrier-class platform could play a role in SpaceX's future operations. One of the most compelling possibilities would be using a large-scale maritime platform for Starship landings. A structure of this size could easily accommodate both Starship and its Super Heavy booster, offering two distinct landing approaches. The first and most straightforward option would be to land Starship using deployable legs, much like Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy land on drone ships. However, given SpaceX's significantly larger size and thrust, a far more robust landing structure would be required. The USS JFK's expansive deck could provide a solid foundation, potentially supporting multiple Starship landings at once. In fact, estimates suggest that up to five starships could be recovered in a single operation, a bold vision that could redefine spacecraft recovery. However, there is a catch. This method would require SpaceX to reintegrate landing legs into Starship's design, something they have deliberately moved away from in favor of the Mechazilla catching system. That said, landing legs may still be necessary for future Moon and Mars missions, making this an important design consideration. Another alternative would be to install a Mechazilla-style catching tower directly onto a floating platform. This structure could enable a vertical landing using a catching system similar to what SpaceX is developing at Starbase. In theory, given the load-bearing capacity of such a platform, it could support both the catch tower and the landing starship. However, this method would require significantly more infrastructure, making a drone ship-style landing the more practical option for now. Regardless of the chosen approach, landing a starship at sea presents several major advantages. First, it eliminates risks to populated areas by shifting landings away from ground infrastructure, reducing potential hazards to nearby communities. Second, it optimizes fuel efficiency by eliminating the need for starship to perform a costly boost-back maneuver, ultimately improving payload capacity and overall operational efficiency. Lastly, it enhances flexibility, allowing a mobile platform to adjust its position as needed instead of requiring Starship to land at a fixed location. This would simplify the landing trajectory and open up new possibilities for adaptable recovery strategies. 
As SpaceX continues pushing the boundaries of innovation, the idea of a sea-based landing platform becomes increasingly intriguing. While nothing is set in stone, one thing is certain. Every new challenge presents an opportunity for groundbreaking advancements. With the rapid evolution of spaceflight, the future of Starship is only getting more exciting. Beyond serving as a landing platform, a vessel like the USS JFK could also support Starship launch operations. SpaceX has previously explored offshore launch concepts notably with the oil rigs Phobos and Deimos, which were intended to serve as floating launch sites for Starship. Had they been fully developed, these platforms would have transported Starship to the open ocean, providing a mobile launch pad equipped with an orbital launch mount, cryogenic fuel storage, and other essential infrastructure. While these modifications would require significant investment, sea-based launches could alleviate pressure on existing land-based sites like Starbase in Texas and the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Launching Starship from the sea would come with notable advantages, including reduced risks to populated areas, optimized fuel efficiency, and increased operational flexibility. Although Phobos and Deimos were ultimately sold, the sighting of the USS JFK has reignited discussions about repurposing large maritime platforms for Starship operations. Beyond launches and landings, a floating platform could also play a crucial role in Starship logistics. With Starbase and Kennedy Space Center expected to serve as the primary Starship hubs, efficiently transporting vehicles and components between these locations will become increasingly vital. A massive carrier-class vessel could function as a mobile shipyard, capable of transporting multiple Starship prototypes or boosters at a time. This would prove particularly beneficial if one site experiences production delays or shortages. Given the projected scale of Starship V3, which would reach 150 meters in height, scalable transport solutions will only become more critical in the future. SpaceX's track record of innovation suggests that a sea-based platform for launch, landing, and transport is not beyond reach. However, whether the company will seriously pursue this option or approach remains to be seen. A reasonable prediction is that once SpaceX successfully catches Starship and Super Heavy around 25 consecutive times, they may explore alternative recovery and optimization methods. Meanwhile, regulatory approval remains a key factor in enabling SpaceX's ambitions. To maintain a high launch cadence in the years ahead, the company must navigate evolving FAA regulations. The FAA recently announced its plan to transition commercial launch licenses to a new regulatory framework before the March 2026 deadline. This shift will require launch providers to transition from older licensing regulations to the Part 450 framework, which was introduced in 2021 to streamline the licensing process for commercial launches and re-entries. However, many in the space industry have voiced concerns about the transition. The Part 450 licensing process has been criticized for its lengthy pre-application requirements and limited guidance from the FAA. At a Senate hearing in October of 2023, SpaceX Vice President Bill Gerstenmaier warned that the regulatory system was at risk of collapse due to the workload involved in shifting licenses to Part 450. Despite these concerns, the FAA remains optimistic that all 20 companies currently operating under older licenses will successfully transition to the new framework by March of 2026. Dan Murray, executive director of the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, confirmed that every affected license holder is already working toward compliance. Speaking at the Space Mobility Conference on January 28th, Murray explained that the FAA has been coordinating transition schedules with each company to ensure completion before the end of 2025. His team is encouraging launch providers to submit vehicle data as early as October to avoid last-minute congestion and allow for a smoother transition. Even with this proactive approach, Murray acknowledged the challenges ahead. As companies continue conducting launches under their existing licenses while simultaneously working on Part 450 compliance, resource constraints will be a concern. He warned that if companies fall behind on their schedules, the workload could become overwhelming toward the end of 2025. However, he also noted significant progress compared to previous years when none of the license holders had begun transitioning to Part 450. The FAA is also working with industry leaders to refine the Part 450 framework. In November of 2024, the agency established an Aerospace Rulemaking Committee, or SPARC, tasked with reviewing the regulations and identifying areas for improvement. This committee, which convened for the first time in December, is expected to deliver recommendations by late summer.
FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation Kelvin Coleman has emphasized the agency's commitment to streamlining the licensing process. Speaking at the Global Spaceport Alliance's Spaceport Summit on January 27th, Coleman highlighted the FAA's efforts to accelerate license approvals. Under current law, the agency has 180 days to issue a launch license once a complete application is submitted. However, for Blue Origin's upcoming New Glenn rocket, the FAA issued a license in just 114 days. Similarly, SpaceX received a modification to its Starship launch license in December, one month before the vehicle's most recent test flight. Both New Glenn and Starship are now operating under Part 450 regulations. While the transition to Part 450 presents challenges, the FAA is confident that the new framework will ultimately create a more efficient regulatory process. By working closely with launch providers, the agency aims to ensure a smooth transition while supporting the rapid growth of the commercial space industry. As SpaceX continues to push toward full operational capability for Starship, regulatory hurdles, infrastructure challenges, and new technological frontiers remain at the forefront. Whether through sea-based launch and landing platforms, optimized transport logistics, or streamlined FAA compliance, SpaceX is laying the groundwork for a new era of spaceflight. The road ahead will be filled with challenges, but with each new milestone, the future of space travel moves closer to reality. Speaking of things moving closer to reality, Vast, a company pioneering the next generation of commercial space stations, has reached a significant milestone in developing its Haven 1 module. However, the company has also announced a revised launch timeline, pushing the expected launch date to no earlier than May of 2026. On February 6th, VAST revealed that it had successfully conducted initial tests on the primary structure qualification article of Haven 1 at its facility in Mojave, California. These tests included a proof test where the module was pressurized to 1.8 times its normal operating pressure followed by a 48-hour leak test which recorded an indiscernible leak rate. Vast CEO Max Hout described the successful proof test as a major achievement, stating that the team passed on the first attempt. While further structural load tests and environmental simulations are planned, these initial results provide valuable insights into the module's integrity and overall feasibility. Hout emphasized that these successes have helped de-risk the rest of the program by confirming that the design holds up under pressure and that the timeline for building a flight-ready module is now clearer. When Haven 1 was first announced in May of 2023, Vast had projected an August 2025 launch. As recently as October of 2024, the company was still targeting a late 2025 launch window. However, following the recent qualification tests, VAST has determined that additional time will be needed to ensure the flight module is properly built and tested. Howitt explained that the team wanted to reach this milestone before making any further scheduling commitments, ensuring that the launch timeline would not have to shift again. Under the revised schedule, VAST expects to complete the primary structure of Haven 1's flight module by July of 2025 with integration and testing continuing throughout the latter half of the year. The module will then undergo environmental testing at the Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio before being transported to Florida for its planned May of 2026 launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9. Following launch, the first crewed mission to Haven 1, transported via a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft, is expected to take place no earlier than June of 2026. While the delay may be disappointing for those eager to see the first operational deployment of Haven 1, this adjusted schedule reflects a pragmatic approach to space station development. VAST's commitment to rigorous testing and quality assurance ensures that Haven 1 will be a reliable and fully operational habitat once it reaches orbit. The company's methodical approach underscores the complexity of constructing a commercial space station and the importance of getting every detail right before launch. As private space stations become a growing focus within the industry, VAST's progress on Haven 1 represents an important step toward expanding human presence in orbit. The success of Haven 1 will not only pave the way for its larger successor Haven 2, but could also contribute to the future landscape of commercial spaceflight, offering new opportunities for research, tourism, and long-term human habitation beyond Earth.
With continued advancements in both launch technology and orbital habitats, the coming years promise to be an exciting era for space exploration. The countdown to 2026 is on, and the journey to a new era of commercial space stations is well underway. The future of spaceflight is unfolding before our very eyes, and with SpaceX at the helm, innovation knows no bounds. Whether on land, at sea, or beyond, every breakthrough brings us closer to a new era of exploration. Stay curious, stay inspired, and keep reaching for the stars. This is AlphaTech, and we'll see you next time for more exciting space updates.